in the future about you hopes to grow by becoming a national program that welcomes student athletes playing all sports. Boone is the author of some Yankee playoff history of his own, of course, but Wednesday's starting pitcher, Luis Severino, not so much. The winner go home wild card playoff leaving little room for error and this game Wednesday night seemingly leaving even less as both the Giants Madison Bumgarner and the Mets Noah Syndergaard matching zeros for much of the game. Lopez and Thaddeus Young are at the top of King's to do list this offseason. It's part of a larger plan the general manager says to get better internally. I went to the toilet to get a drink of water because we couldn't help ourselves to get any water, you know, and if we asked, they wouldn't give it to us. So I went to the toilet. I was hearing all these like weird noises. I went towards, you know, where the noise was. One of the foster sisters that were already there, she was raping my brother. You know, she was forcing my brother to do things to her. It's one of several horrible memories Bree Kavanaugh has from her early childhood. Put into the foster system at age two, Bree and her brother Dewan spent the next four years in more than a dozen different homes. They had, did not care whatsoever because you know what? If they did care, you know, you know, we would have been fed more. You know what I mean? We would have been treated ten times better than what we were treated. Stories Bree says even many of her closest friends don't know, including a shooting in one of her foster homes. Pop, pop. And the next thing you know, you know. We look and we see a whole stream of blood just coming right by our feet. And we're just sitting there looking like, like, you know, just, just terrified, like just completely terrified. I guess it goes for each house that we went to. We were just like that. We always ended up somewhere in a corner, just, just like either whether we were crying, shaking, you know, we just had no idea like what was next. We were just, what was like, what's next? What was next was love. Introduced to the Kavanaugh's. So when we, when we first met them, it was hilarious. This little girl with her brother Duan jumps on me, grabs my neck. Like, can we call you mom and dad? That was the first thing we said. That was the first thing we said. And we, ne we didn't say it to anybody else but those two. That's what they became. Bree says therapy has helped greatly. No matter what she's been through, she always rises above. Yeah! Yeah! Basketball has brought her to Fordham where this season, Bree's first in uniform for the Rams, she's emerged as an all-conference player. So for me, it's just trying to embrace her and love her and care about her and, and let her know, you know, we'll, we'll get through anything. I will never be able to, you know, just erase it from my mind. It's just, it'll always stay there. Bree wants her story out now to let kids in a similar position know that there's hope. As for her future, well, she's working on what's been her goal since she was young, to be in the FBI. At Fordham University, I'm Dan Serafin, News 12, The Bronx Sports. Today, Daniel Jacobs seems to have it all. A world champion in the ring, he trains for his next bout this August here in the borough he calls home. Outside of the ring, he works just as hard to make sure everyone he meets has a smile on their face almost as big as the one Jacobs always seems to have on his. This is something that I dreamed of. This is something that... I've always wanted not just to be uh, a, a champion, a boxing world champion, uh, but to be a people's champion. To feel how each day is a victory for Jacobs now, you need to know just how close to defeat he was a little more than four years ago. He came to the hospital, he was partially paralyzed. He had a tumor essentially arising from the bone that was severely compressing the spinal cord. Jacob's passion for boxing started here at the Howard Houses in Brownsville. A chance to get back at the neighborhood bully. Jacob's then 14 years old decided to be a better idea to stand up to him inside a boxing ring than in the school cafeteria. The rest is history. Beat up the kid. <laughs> he never returned to the gym and I found, you know, love for the sport. I knew I had some talent because First six months into boxing, I won my first national championship. He won New York's Golden Gloves four times. I started to travel the world. I started to see uh, so many different things in so many different places as a teenager. Being from Brownsville, I never had the chance to really see outside of my neighborhood. So boxing was my savior. Then nicknamed the Golden Child, Jacobs won his first 20 pro fights, but was still just a young man. 22, 23 years old and in and out of clubs, not really taking my boxing career 
that serious because I was gifted, right? When you're gifted, you don't have to go the extra mile. His first loss as a pro came in July of 2010. Jacobs fought twice more, both victories, before he started feeling a growing weakness throughout his body. We flew over on the USO tour to Iraq. And that's when I really started to feel weak in my legs. Within two months, Jacobs couldn't walk. Doctors at New York Presbyterian had to work quickly. Diagnosed with osteosarcoma, a cancerous tumor attached to Jacobs' spinal cord was growing rapidly. An urgent, urgent operation to take the pressure off the spinal cord. It was a somewhat new procedure using a GPS system that allowed doctors, led by Dr. Roger Hartle, to accurately perform surgery without opening up the entire spine. I remember being in the hospital and uh, having nights where I used to cry. I didn't think it would be possible for me to be able to perform again because at the point where I was paralyzed it was probably my worst state ever. I couldn't see it because physically I couldn't even move my legs. I watched a lot of movies and I always see these cases where the doctors always say, you can't do this and you can't do that, and they always prove the doctor wrong, you know? So I started to look at it in, in, in that way, in that manner. Days after the surgery, Jacobs was walking. Physical therapy started six weeks later. Three months after surgery, Jacobs was cleared for athletic activities. Once I told myself I was gonna be able to do it, that's when I went full throttle. 18 months after surgery, Jacobs fought again in Brooklyn's Barclays Center. A first round knockout win, the comeback has been the stuff of Hollywood movies. Seven fights, seven knockout victories. In August of 2014, Jacobs won the WBA middleweight championship. Me just being able to get back into the ring was something that I wanted to do, which was far-fetched at one point. So for me to become a champion and do it in the manner in which I've done it, I mean, seven knockouts, since I've been back, you know, it's, it's unheard of. As Jacob's story spread, his profile grew, but he's determined to do good, first and foremost, by his community. I'm still in Brownsville to show these people and to show my people, you know, I'm here. And even though I'm this guy who has been successful and, and quote unquote made it, you know, I haven't made it until I've done some good in my community. Handing out food and gifts, Jacobs returned to this Brownsville apartment building days after we went with him to give more. These are my Brownsville community. I connect with these people. They know the, the struggle. Among the boxing community, Jacobs is a star. Meeting with former fighters from the city, he's the guy everyone wants a picture with. I'm proud of my story. I, I've done it. I, I'm never going to get tired of telling it because there's always going to be someone who could be inspired by my story. For News 12 Overtime, I'm Dan Serafin. Bay Ridge's Boyd Melson has always put others before himself. We highlight the latest example of that and tell you of a selfless act. Boyd Nelson is part of a military family. It was different. His parents, his siblings, all served. We're a military family, this is what we do. And when Boyd went to West Point in June of 1999, his call of duty was clear. This is putting myself first because this is how my heart beats. But life had other plans. At West Point, Boyd was introduced to the world of boxing. And he was good at it competing internationally as part of the Army's world-class athlete program. Boxing kept Boyd from active duty. It's something he admits weighed heavily on him. I just thought, what the heck am I doing? I, I should be out there. Maybe I could make a decision that would save somebody's life. So in 2008, at the age of 26, Boyd started his career in the U.S. Army Reserve. And when his tour of duty was over in 2011, Boyd stayed on as a reservist because he says he still wanted to do more for his country. If me first means putting everyone else first, that's how you want to look at it, fine. So in 2008, at the age of 26, Boyd started his career in the U.S. Army Reserve. And when his tour of duty was over in 2011, Boyd stayed on as a reservist because he says he still wanted to do more for his country. I have to do all this and the rest of my life will take care of itself if I just keep living my purpose. All the while continuing with his other calling in life, 
but this pro boxer was a champion of a different creed. His winnings went to spinal cord research because Boyd wanted to do more. And he did, volunteering his time to recovering drug addicts, giving free boxing lessons on the weekend. Last year, Boyd started a campaign to run for United States Congress. Boyd has always gone to the max with his um, promises. But still, Boyd wanted to do more. And more specifically, he wanted active army duty. By November of 2017, he was asking other reservists being called if he could take their place. One of them, Major Rebecca Finley. She first declined, but a few weeks later, Finley, living outside Pittsburgh, received what she calls a once-in-a-lifetime job offer with the Army's Active Guard Reserve that might not be there after a tour of active duty. I was excited, and yeah, he, uh, he, he was the first person that came to mind since, you know, just a few weeks prior, he had already reached out to me um, to see if I was willing to allow him to take my place. So Finley called up Boyd, who she'd only met face to face once a few weeks prior, and asked him if he was serious, if he would take her year long deployment. It was stressful having to go back and ask that person, like, you know what, can you take my place even though I told you um, no initially? So I had some reservations. Instantly, I said yes. A soldier needed my help and I needed to do this for some time. I'm very privileged and honored to get to put this uniform on, go out and join my brothers and sisters in the history of our nation. Just days before Boyd's deployment, Mendez Boxing Gym in Manhattan. He's here for a few hugs. Actually, lots. And lots of hugs. It's me missing them that is making me sad. All the hugs that I love giving whenever I walk in that gym that I'm not going to be able to give. I'm excited for him because I know he's such an outstanding soldier, an outstanding officer, and he's going to be very, very productive and very much an asset to the people he's working with overseas. Now 36 years old, Boyd put his run for Congress on hold. Breakthroughs perhaps nearing in spinal cord research, a nonprofit about to form from his boxing training with recovering addicts. But it makes me appreciate it more because I don't have children and I don't have a wife, so I don't know what that part is like. So I, it's like a um, sadistic type thing. What can I sacrifice while I'm to, that I have to give up on so I can, so I can join those that had to give up so much for our country. Boyd tells us a book written by his West Point classmate Marquise Bruce has helped him live his life so unselfishly. He's scheduled to return to the United States later this year. Reporting for News 12, I'm Dan Serafin. This music gets better each and every week we do this. I really do. I'm really enjoying this intro music more I mean, than I ever thought I would. You don't play in your car when you're driving around. I try not to, but it does just sneak me. onto there every once in a while. We're not. We're not rolling. No, nope. are we? No, we're rolling. Ah, okay. I, I don't either. Um, <laughs> the random wrestler last week. Nails was nails. Mm -hmm. We've been going on a pretty good clip lately, but we've been going back in time, mm -hmm. which is you know, I mean, we've we've said for a while that. The back in time random wrestlers and I mean the, it, the it, current random for the people wrestlers. you haven't thought of in a while. If you go back further in time, obviously you haven't thought about them. I mean, in a like while. you know, baseball has like its replacement level player. Mm -hmm. So what's like the replacement level random wrestler? The replacement level like what, the like so anything type? above ab anything above this person is not a random wrestler. Definitely, I don't know. Ken oh. Shamrock, I'd say, is like the the replacement. Okay, level. That, that could work. Is Ken, Ken Shamrock a random wrestler? No. Nah. Oh, okay. Um, Where are you going with this? Duke the Dumpster Drossy. Oh, we're finally this guy. Yes. All right. Everybody remembers Duke the Dumpster Drossy, and if you don't, I don't know what's wrong with you. He checks off the marks for the wrestler that had the occupation. Of course, just, not a very good occupation, but an just occupation nonetheless. Literally just the garbage man. Mm -hmm. A championship. A celebration in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, 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 Brooklyn. For Michael Ramsey, it's a long way both geographically and physically from where he was four years ago. Growing up in sunny Orange County, California, Ramsey has no problem saying things were easy. It wasn't real. Already excelling on the soccer field, Ramsey was a goalkeeper with a Division I college career well within reach. But on November 19, 2011, 
everything changed. I was um, running in the dark with my friends okay. and I didn't see a high-waisted chain that was there and I ended up um, hitting the chain and I hit my head on a curve that was on the left side of my body. I was kind of in and out of consciousness at this point. They wheeled me into the ambulance and then I remember them closing the doors and I woke up eight days later. Those eight days spent in an induced hypothermic coma. They thought that I was going to be paralyzed on the right side of my body. They didn't think I was ever going to be able to speak again or swallow or really be a normal human being ever again. He wasn't really responding very much to, uh, you know, to command, so it was, it was clear that something was going on. But quickly, Ramsey surprised his doctors. The moment that my surgeon came in to talk to me, he told me, you know, you're, you're a miracle. I've never seen anything like this. Without much of the left side of his skull, which was removed to make room for his swollen brain, Ramsey continued making dramatic progress. After two weeks of rehab, he was discharged. Almost a month after that, Ramsey returned to the hospital for surgery to reattach that part of his skull. His final surgery, he thought. I thought I was at the finishing line at that point. Everybody thought I was. Everybody was celebrating. The nurses were celebrating. Everybody was happy that it was some, you know, miracle. Ten hours after that surgery on January 5th, I had a massive hemorrhage right in my speech center. So that really set me back to... I was worse than I was um, waking up, like by far. This time, Ramsey was paralyzed. And I woke up the next day and I didn't know what happened. Five brain surgeries in the span of eight weeks. Doctors stabilized Ramsey, but once again, the prognosis wasn't good. Suffering from aphasia, Ramsey could understand what people said to him and use his brain to think of a response, but he couldn't speak, at least not in English. Funny thing was that I could speak Spanish correctly. You know, I was taking Spanish class and I couldn't speak my, my primary language, but I guess secondary language is in some different part of my, your brain. Continuing his soccer career seemed like a pipe dream. I'm not somebody to um, allow somebody to set my own standards. It took six months of speech therapy for Ramsey to get back his full vocabulary. Next was getting back on the field. That took much longer. In July of 2012, nine months after his initial fall, Ramsey started no contact soccer drills. A month later, he was cleared by doctors for contact, but he was just not ready for it. Ramsey never thought about quitting, but says he didn't think he'd be good enough to play at a high level anymore. I was terrified to get back into the cold. Wearing a specially designed helmet, Ramsey's club team saved a spot for his return, but it took months for him to get comfortable on the field. Do you really want to keep doing this? And do you really want to keep battling with yourself? And I think, is it worth it? And then I thought, you know, it is worth it. And so I kind of just stopped thinking and I went out there and started playing. By the fall of 2012, Ramsey was back on track. LIU Brooklyn was in contact, interested in bringing him across the country to play soccer, and that idea intrigued him. Over the next year, he got back his prior form, and on Halloween of 2013, nearly two years after his initial fall, he committed to LIU Brooklyn, accepting a scholarship. Michael never stops in terms of his own effort. You know, he, he's the best example of a guy that will give everything for his team and for himself to improve. After his college soccer career ends, it's not surprising how Ramsey plans to make a living. I want to be a neurosurgeon, actually. After I had that hemorrhage, um, I, I just felt like I had this calling, you know, to be a neurosurgeon. Like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Ramsey says because of his own past, he wants to help kids who face similarly long odds showing them that miracles happen. A kid can have 30 needles in him and, you know, half a head, and he can come back and look normal. And so it's, home, it's hard to picture. And so I kind of, you know, paint that picture for them and say, like, you know, this is what I was and this is what I am now. Like, it's possible to be okay. It's even possible to become a champion. For News 12 Overtime, I'm Dan Serafin.